permission to be here. We have this time together. We're going to take up all the time. Uh, and it's going to be great. If you want to leave, you can always leave. Like, I don't care. So, uh, okay, cool. So the syllabus, for, so I'm still not fish, in case you're wondering. Um, we will hopefully be back next week. And everything will be smooth sailing, and you'll be in great hands from here on out. Uh, so he would like me to go through the syllabus of the next week for you, so you have that all figured out. Um, on Monday, you're going to get a crash course on cryptography, which is going to be super fun. Uh, a history of crypto. You're going to talk about semantic encryption, or sorry, semantic, uh, symmetric. That wasn't a plug for that company either. You'll learn. You'll talk about symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, how those work at a high level, and then you're going to get ready for the first and second homework assignments. And this is a nice picture from Fish. Everyone loves to do homework, right? And then on Wednesday, you will have your first in-class CTF, and it's going to be super awesome. Um, so I'm actually, and don't panic, this is, uh, it's not going to be scored in the sense that, actually I don't know in what sense, but it's not scored in that you're, I would say the safe thing to say is your ranking is not going to matter, so if you end up in last place or whatever, that doesn't mean you're going to get a zero or whatever. Um, the idea is to get you exposed to this concept of capture the flags in class. Um, it's an hour long, so don't be late. You're going to start early. And the services that you'll be hacking on will be released on Piazza 24 hours before the class. So uh, I think there's only 10 people signed up for that. So you should sign up for, you can go to Piazza, look for ASU uh, CSE 545. You can sign up for the course. Fish has already set that up. Shall we do it really quickly as a group? Yes, why not? Yes. Will you be putting the slides up there too in the first two lessons? I will ask him to do that, yes. Okay. And I also posted on my YouTube channel the video recording of, what's today, Wednesday? So Monday? Of Monday. I'll ask him to put that up there as well so you can get a link for that. <coughs> do we need a particular OS for the capture the flag? That's a good question. Uh, I would say you would probably be. So let's. we're going to do this all. Wait, let me do incognito mode so it's not me logged in. CSE 545, Piazza, look at us. That's fall 2012, that's unlikely to be the right thing. See, this is good that we do this all together that way. Uh, how do I do this? Students get started. Let's pretend I'm a student. I go to ASU, Arizona State University, CSE 545, bang. Instructor Fish Wang, 12 students enrolled, can sign up for the course, everything will be good. What was their question? Oh, uh, the operating system. I would, um, well, maybe it's on the next slide, because there's a checklist for next week. <coughs> so do I have access to a computer? So a couple of you came up uh, to me after class. If that was you, please talk to Fish. His email is very easy. It's fishw at asu.edu or I'm sure you can contact him through the Piazza thing as well. Send him an email if you don't have access to a working functional laptop that you can bring into class. Um, I'm also gonna help him figure out a better room because this is a great lecture hall, it's not a great CTF room. Um, so talk to him about that because there are options. The department has some computers, he'll have to figure out how to bring them and get that to you, but that can all be solved, but it needs to be proactive we don't want people showing up on Wednesday being like, oh, but I just brought a pencil because that's what I, I do. Um, so you need to bring your computer to play a CTF. Um, so the contact fish, so if you can't bring it, contact fish as soon as possible. We'll get it all sorted out. Everything will be super easy. It'll be fun. Um, <laughs> what is this? Uh, cool. Okay, so. You should have, at the very minimum, a computer that you can run SSH on, I would say, in terms of hardware. So this is PuTTY. If you're on Windows, if you're on Mac, it already has a built-in SSH client. If you're running Linux, then that's awesome. Um, you should know how to use SSH to access a host, because I think that's how this is all going to work. Um, if you can, my suggestion would be not knowing anything about what's going to happen. My suggestion is to run a, if you're not running Linux natively, get access to a Linux virtual machine running on your, your machine. So um, VirtualBox is free. Get VirtualBox, install Ubuntu 18.04. I would recommend, especially for those 
I mean, my recommendation is always to run the server edition, not the GUI. Although, well, maybe for this, that'd be fine. Anyways, I mean, you're analyzing binaries. You don't really need a graphical user interface. Plus, that uses up a lot of CPU, in my opinion. So I almost always run the server editions of things and then SSH into them from my local machine. But your mileage may vary. Do whatever is best for you that works for you. Questions? All right, so we're done for the syllabus for next week. All right, cool. <coughs> so now we get, get to go into uh, NAS is actually something I like, that I actually really like about this class is talking about history. So why do we care about history? Isn't that just something that old people did and we should just ignore and do our own thing? I'm seeing some heads nodding. Anyone? Thoughts? So no, there's no wrong answers. Yeah. What? No, it's not? No. Why is, why is it important to look at history? Because we can learn from it. You can learn from it and maybe apply those lessons in the past into the future. Any other reasons why? You don't have to reinvent something. You don't have to reinvent something. That's actually something that happens a lot, especially in research areas. If somebody comes up with a crazy new thing and then all of the old timers are like, actually, that was already done in the 70s by so-and-so. And then, I don't know, usually you just ignore them or do it different or you figure out a new way that makes it new and different and unique. Um, especially with hacking, it's really, you know, part of hacking is not just the, oh, I don't know, I'm gonna exploit this buffer overflow to do this stuff. There's a whole kind of culture from hacking and that comes from understanding famous hacks, famous viruses, famous hackers of the past to kind of see how they did things so you can see how the field has evolved. So it's actually, one thing I really like is uh, talking about hacking. But to do that, we need to first start with the internet. What's the internet? It's a series of tubes. It's a series of tubes. It's incorrect. And then kind of also slightly correct. It's very, very confusing. What senator said that? I don't, I, from Alaska. I don't remember the name, but. What is the internet? And for me, it's always a capital I. I don't care what anyone says. Just a very large hierarchical network. A very large hierarchical network. Ooh, who's at the top? The ISPs. CIA. CIA. <laughs> NSA. Yeah. I mean, but if it's a hierarchy, somebody should be at the top, right? Who's at the top? The ISP. Which ISP? Okay. There's no single one. Yes, there's no single one. So the internet, right, you can think of just a connected set of autonomous networks, right? So each ISP runs their own thing. ASU <coughs> runs their own huge, crazy, complicated network. Would you agree? So you, I didn't say this, man. Sorry, I'm teaching two different classes. I mean, I'm teaching Fish's classes and my class, so I have no idea which stories I've told in either of them. So if I say something and repeat myself, stop me. But um, so ASU has to deal with this problem where every year a quarter of the people using the ASU network leave, and then a quarter new students come. They continually have new students with, I mean, new people with new devices and new things on their network, which makes defending and securing their network insane. Like, I don't even understand how they do that. Um, so ASU has their network. They're connected probably to some ISPs that interconnect with other people, right? So that when you th really break it down, right, an internet is a connected series of networks. And the internet is the big one that we all talk about. Uh, are there any other interconnected big networks? There's the US highways. The what? The US highways. Uh, let's go data based or not data based, but uh, yes, I mean, technically you can think of that as a network, but what about like a digital network, let's say? Is the internet it? Cellular yeah. networks. Cellular networks, that could be a good one. Yeah, they or the phone network, that would be another one. So you have the cell phones connecting to a tower, which has all of the like. SS7 and all this sig crazy switching signaling architecture from the 80s. What else? Uh, air traffic control. Air traffic control. Hmm. I don't know anything about that, so I can't comment. Yeah. Web hyperlinks. Web hyperlinks can form a network or a web, yeah. Private organizations will have their own networks. Yeah, and crazy complicated at that, right? They might have incredibly complex networks. The military has a completely separate network. Milnet is a completely 
they were actually, we'll talk about it, they, military networks used to be connected to the internet, and at a certain point they decided, hey, that's a terrible idea. So they have a completely separate, fully, you know, end to end. Completely separate. Yes, probably, okay, several. See, these are things that I don't uh, know about outside, so it's good to learn about. Um, and so, you can think of this, and so the key here is autonomous, right? Every network runs independently, and this is where I would push back a little bit with this hierarchy idea, because fundamentally, as long as you can talk to somebody, well, not really, I guess. The problem with the hierarchy is there's nobody at the top. There's no king of the, or queen of the internet, right? So there's a set of autonomous systems. Everybody runs their networks independently. It's more or less an open architecture, and everybody kind of has different goals. And I'd say this is probably a true statement. Has everyone used the internet today? Yes, has anybody not? Maybe you just woke up 10 minutes ago and rode to class <laughs> without figuring out how the traffic was or anything? Yeah, everybody uses the internet all the time. Like I actually can't, I think there's, well, one day that I didn't open my laptop where I was like super happy, um, but I still have my phone. So it's important to look at the history of the internet, and we'll see why in a second. But the internet was funded by DARPA, which I think I mentioned on the first day. So DARPA is the agency that funds kind of crazy research projects. One of those crazy research projects is the internet. So kind of very cool to see tax dollars at work impacting kind of not just the military, but also civilian networks. Um, very interesting. I love this picture. So the first. Uh, so the first four nodes of, so this is actually a picture of a napkin where they drew the diagram for the intern, the ARPANET as it was called. So you had uh, UCLA, UCSB, uh, Stanford Research Institute, and Utah. So why four? Do you need four for a network? If you have one computer, do you have a network? Not really. If you have two computers, do you have a network? You have two computers talking to each other, right? It's a lot simpler than having a big, giant network, right? You have three computers, do you have a network? Yeah. Yeah. But why is there four? So you're going to build the first network. Why do you build four nodes instead of three? What was it? Guesses? I don't know. Ideas. Thoughts? A backup if one of the nodes is bad. A backup if one of the nodes is bad? Yeah. But at least here, SRI is central. So if they go down, there's no way to connect to the other nodes. What do you think? There's PDB 10 there, so maybe they had the... Maybe diversity of operating systems, or I guess, I don't know, machines. operating systems or machines. Di uh, <coughs> diversity of machines, that'd be one of yeah. Load balancing? Load balancing, in what sense? If uh, you have four machines, what's the load going to be? If the load on SRI is too much, they mm. can transfer some of it to Utah. Yeah, or maybe UCSB, or maybe the loads on these links are different. Maybe you can try different crazy <coughs> routing things. Maybe they're already Maybe they're already connected, that's a good reason. So you don't actually have to spend money to connect them if there was already a link between SRI and Utah. Yeah. Uh, where, who's building this? DARPA, DARPA is funding this. Where does DARPA's money come from? Taxpayers. Taxpayers. What's different about, well, one of those locations is different than all the others. It's in a different state. It's in a different state, yes. So. If you had all three, if this is what you're going to have as your first network, you have people complaining that if this is just a California project that you're funding and you're not funding like an interstate project. So this is a reason I've heard that Utah was included, which I like to talk about <laughs> because as computer scientists, we often go to technology first. and like, oh yeah, these are the technical reasons why this should happen. But there are just as good reasons as political reasons so that nobody criticizes your project and shuts it down for being a California only thing. Now you can say you're including all these states. Yeah. Uh, from yeah. what my heard was, this network was formed to share to share the researches with uh, uh, each other. Of course, that's what they say, right? But to, to even, I mean, that's the purpose of creating this, right? But you could easily say, I mean, UCSB. Plus, you think about UCSB and UCLA are both public institutions, yeah. but part of the same UC system. SRI is a private institution, and so having the University of Utah there really helps, kind of. Make it be a well-balanced thing of entities that are getting funding, right? Because each of these people is getting funding to build this thing. So from the political perspective, if you're the agency doing this, you want to make sure nobody can criticize the way you're distributing funds. 
Cool. Anyways, that's a cool side note. So it was, um, so they created this, and you think about it, this was in the, the 19, like late 60s, early 70s that they actually started creating this. And this is where the entire internet that we deal with today comes from, which is insane to think about. Do they take it back off the telephone network, or do they run a wire? I actually don't know. That's a good question. I don't know a ton about the tech that was back then. I would guess there's probably some dial-up, but this may have been big enough where they had some kind of connection, is my <coughs> guess. But um, yeah, that'd be an interesting thing to look at. So originally, it was all based on something called NCP, the Network Control po Protocol. Um, and what they realized is that, and if you look, you can go back, look at the history here. Um, I believe it was NCP had no congestion control. So TCP, I think as you'll see later in this course, if you haven't taken a networking course, if it detects a dropped packet, it drops its rate of packet sending to slowly build back up, right? Because it says, oh, there must be some congestion in the network. Time to stop sending, let that congestion go. NCP didn't have anything like that, and so packets were just getting sent all the time. They were having massive congestion problems. So think about this. You started to build. So as we'll eventually see, you know, TCP or NCP at this point was a like core protocol of the internet. And then you want to upgrade it. So how do you do that? Think about now. Let's say you, right now, you're a genius, which you all are and you've come up with some crazy new approach for TCP that's gonna be better, it's gonna save everybody bandwidth, it's gonna be more secure, it is objectively better than TCP. How do you roll that out? Get it recognized as a standard. Get it recognized as a standard, and then what do you do? You, Get it everyone to make it. you replace every single device that ever talks to the internet to no. change from TCP to TCP 2.0? Make it that make it back compatible. compatible. You try to make it backwards compatible, or if you can't? You make Apple do it first. You make <laughs> Apple do it first, that's a pretty interesting roll idea. Roll it out in phases. Yeah, you can try all these things. Uh, this is the problem that they came with. They wanted to move to this new thing, TCP, in 1983. And so they actually had, uh, what this was January 1st, it's called the Flag Day, where they, at this point in 83, they, I've actually seen it. Uh, one of the professors at UCSD <laughs> has this they call like the, I think it's called like the ARPANET phone book or the internet phone book. It's like this thick, every computer that was on the internet with, along with the administrator, their name, their phone number. So they coordinated with everybody. They shut everything down on January 1st. They installed the TCP update and then they brought everything back up. Yeah, insane. Think about doing that now. That's just like crazy. Like, guys, we'll just take, we'll take an internet break for one day. <laughs> no Instagram, no Snapchat, no emails, nothing. We'll just stop, and the next day we'll have uh, brand new stuff. It'll be awesome. So you can't really do that. Um, and I'm going to skip some of this. Um, cool. OK, so the crazy thing about the internet is what started to happen in the 90s and early 2000s is the size just exploded. But, so, but the web, so when we think of the internet, we mostly think of the web. Would you agree with that? <coughs> yeah, what are some non-web internet applications? Email. Email? Yeah, SMTP, IMAP, POP, those are all standards that are completely separate from the web. What else? FTP, Gopher. IRC. Gopher, IRC. <coughs> Xbox Live. Xbox Live, although that's a closed protocol, I'd say, so I wouldn't count that. But yeah, I'm sure somebody's reverse engineered parts of it. Bolts. What's that? Bolts. What's Bolts? It's for interacting with craft spaces. Oh, cool. OK, Bolts. What else? Remote login. Voice over IP. Remote lo our login. <coughs> uh, VoIP. Torrents. Torrents. FTP. SSH. <coughs> Telnet before that. I'm running out of fingers. So all of these things were things that, ex well, not all of those things, but a lot of those things actually existed before the web at all. So if you think about pre-early 90s, if you had access to the internet, you could tell that into machines, you could, I don't actually know, I guess get on bulletin boards using yes. whatever crazy stuff, BBS system. This is actually before my time, so I didn't play with any of that. Um, but. But it was still a very niche area, and it does, didn't really take off in the way that we think about it now. And so it wasn't really until 1991 when Tim Berners-Lee was at CERN. And what does CERN do? 
Yeah, the, Hadron Collider. yeah, they do one of the things is the Large Hadron Collider, where I'm not a physicist, but they're like throwing particles at each other to generate a lot of data to <coughs> see what's what, while in the process not destroying the Earth. So, at least I guess we can say so far they have not. And the problem is, is like a big institution, a research institution, they have people constantly coming and going and working on different things, and it was very difficult to understand who was doing what. And so, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, he decided that, uh, and this was, there's some ideas were floating in the time, around at the time, so it, he wasn't the only one, but basically he said, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could have a way for you to view a text document, and then at certain places in there, you could have like a link to another text document that could have more information <coughs> with links to other things. So you could have a link of who are all the people who are currently working on system X. And then each of their names could have links to their homepage, which would have their offices or whatever. And that's literally what started the, the web as we know it. It's actually kind of insane. And after that, the internet essentially explodes. So this is a graph from over time, I believe this is the number of sites on the web, like I think probably 480 on the internet, but I don't know how this data is actually collected, from 1999 to 2006. And you can see that even here, the old dates, right? 1990, there was one. There's one website, one. And you can actually go see what that website is. It's a historical uh, website. Uh, 91, 10, 50, and then now you can see it starts getting into 6 million, which in 1999, during the first dot-com bubble, that seems like a lot. And then you fast forward to today, we're in, what's that? Uh, billions, roughly, in here. Yeah. I think it's just counting. I think it's... Um, How do you even measure that? Yeah, I would. I bet what they're doing is doing an internet-wide scan of port 80. Yeah. So they're probably not getting a lot of uh, virtual domains and stuff. Doesn't I mean, Google would have much better numbers for all of these, right? So. Doesn't, I think it's ICANN keep a record of every website also? Domain they have domain names, but you can have subdomain names, which could be their own <coughs> unique sites. Does this, I have no idea what this is doing. But it's a nice graph that goes, shows kind of this. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we can all agree it's been growing like crazy. So uh, this is an insane graph of the internet, <coughs> uh, all the interconnections of all the, the networks, I believe, and the traffic. So why is this important to hacking? Everything's connected, man. No, but, I mean, maybe that's part of it. What was it? Find loopholes. Finding loopholes in this. What is that? I mean, that's is your goal. But why do you need an internet for that? Sitting here, you can uh, try some stuff at someone else's uh, computer. Yeah. So now you go from this scenario. So if you think about the physical space, right? If you think about, okay, we'll put on our black hats for a second, or I guess our black ski masks, maybe in this case. <laughs> Let's say we want to go break into houses, but we don't want to like actually break in. We just want to go see how many houses are not locking their front door. So if you want to take, I don't know, how many houses could you reasonably expect to do in, let's say, an hour? 10, 20, 20, 30 maybe. After that, you have to start like either physically running up the things and everything, you'd have to try a door and then run to the next one and you'll get tired at some point. It's like 20, 30. So now, what if anyone on Earth could try jiggling your front door to test if it's locked? If anyone on Earth could do that, we would probably take the security of our locks and keys a lot <coughs> more um, seriously. So this is the world of the internet where exactly what you said, anyone if you want, you can, uh, there are tools now, I think it's ZMAP, that you can scan all the entire IPv4 address range in less than an hour. Wow. Um, you can, there are sites, there are all kinds of ways, so you can basically, so criminals now can basically jiggle all the front doors in a very small amount of time. And anyone can basically be attacked by anyone in this network. So this is an important thing to consider because this greatly changes the way we think about security now. Cool. Any questions on internet? The internet? <coughs> this is a brief overview just to give you kind of scale, right, of thinking like how big these things, this network is. 
And it's basically, and the, I mean, the other crazy thing, if you don't have a, uh, a king or queen of the internet, there's nobody to say, like, you cannot access the internet now. You are a bad person. Because um, it's all autonomous systems. Everybody running their own network individually. And then when packets go out, they go out. So it's crazy. So I'm going to skip over that. So we are going to start off with talking about something that has very little to do with computers called phone freaking. Does anybody, has anybody seen recently a payphone? Yes. Where? New York. New York? Ooh, cool. Was, did it actually work? Did anybody check? At the yeah. airport? Yeah, the airport. Interesting. And, and do they work? Yeah. Huh? Buckeye, Arizona. Buckeye, interesting. Okay, cool. So they do exist. So most people may be familiar with the concept. At a payphone, you go in. You lift up, you need to put money in the device to make a phone call. Um, it also used to be back in the day that you didn't have unlimited calling to any number basically on earth. You had to pay, like you had unlimited, usually you had unlimited <coughs> local calling, but long distance calling costs a lot of money. So if you're a phone company, how do you do that? How do you charge for a phone call? How do you restrict people from accessing certain things? How do you do the reverse of let people access certain things? Well, making the gateways for like network. Yeah, so you have all these switches kind of, and used to be old school, like plug things into different things, switches, which I still don't understand how they work, but, um, and <coughs> along with that, so you have switches along the way, and they would communicate with each other over some protocol to say like, oh, this is a, whatever, this person paid, this person didn't pay. What some people found out is that they were transmitting that data over the same voice channel. Because fundamentally you have this problem where somebody needs to speak through the phone, it needs to go through some voice channel, and then you have all this metadata about the call, about who they're calling, is the call paid for or not, um, all this metadata, and they transmitted that over the same voice line. And what hackers eventually figured out, or the early hackers that are called phone freakers found out, is that you could, if you made those same tones, because it's frequencies at different frequencies. So if you made that tone, you could get a call for free. And then it turns out that um, so there's a guy, his story is actually really sad. Um, so this guy who became famous and known as Captain Crunch, uh, he found out that the whistle that comes in Captain Crunch cereal produced a sound at exactly this frequency of 2600. And this looked like this, and that was the frequency to get free long distance calling. And so, and this was used by AT&T, and this was back when AT&T was a monopoly before they were split up. So basically you had, like AT&T was the entire phone network for the United States. So you think about this, finds this toy in a cereal box, you blow a whistle into the phone and you get free phone calls from there. And if you think about the phone calls, I mean, I guess I don't have numbers off the top of my head, but it was expensive. It's like, I don't know, 50 cents or, if you watch old movies from that time, a common or sitcoms, a common plot point is like, oh my gosh, you were calling your long distance boyfriend or girlfriend and you drove the phone bill up to $100 in a month, which to us is like insane. Like why would anybody ever deal with that? But. <coughs> Um, and so this, and what they realized, and so what a lot of hackers started doing is uh, they would, they built a box, which they call a blue box that had a bunch of buttons on it that could make different tones to do different things. So they started experimenting, learning about the phone system and tried to see what tones do what. Um, and so Draper, uh, so he was sentenced for five years probation for phone fraud because getting service for free from the phone company is illegal. Um, and <coughs> there's actually a whole lot to this story that you can go look up. There was people who became like well known for being able to make these tones and these sounds themselves without the help of a blue box. Um, so they could just literally like whistle into the phone to be able to do things. They could do crazy things like bounce a phone signal across multiple switches across the earth. So like it would go from like the US to Europe to the US to Asia to Europe to a call and just like crazy stuff just by 
partly reverse engineering, partly I think they stole manuals, like um, user manuals. And so why do we care about phone freaking besides that it's awesome? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'm editorializing a bit. Because like uh, anyone can hear what you're talking and they can. Yeah, so anyone could, could hear, so that maybe gets into the security aspects. What else, why? Yeah. Hacking in what sense? Yeah, well, your reverse engineering has something works to manipulate. Yeah, so that's, and that's um, my philosophy, really, is that, so there's a couple reasons. A is the, so part of this is that um, one of the early, like, hacker zines, like, magazines, online zines, is called 2600, and it's because of this. Um, a lot of the early Computer hackers and network hackers came from this phone freaking background. So they started as phone freakers and then transitioned. So there's a lot of overlap in the community and there's a lot of things there. But yeah, it's really a super cool thing about um, like why um, about understanding a system at such a fundamental level that gives you total control over that system. And so here, this system just happens to be the phone network. What we're going to be learning about and focusing on here are computer systems and network systems, but at the same time, it's really the same thing. It's just knowledge about a system gives you that control over it, um, which is super cool. All right, so <coughs> one of the early things, so if you think about where we are now, and you think about where we were in the 90s with websites kind of starting, and then you think about go all the way back to where the internet was first created in 67. You have in there this awesome, so what's an RFC? Request for comments. Request for comments is an official RFC, although it's kind of, I think, if I remember correctly, I think the December issues were mostly like the fun RFCs or something. Um, so Bob Metcalf wrote this RFC trying to basically warn people a little bit about the state of security, um, even in these early, early days of, I can't remember if they call it the internet yet or if it's still the ARPANET. Oh, there we go, ARPANET. Okay, so I've done a lot of talking. Does anybody want to do a dramatic reading of this for us? Doesn't have to be that dramatic. <laughs> reading words on a screen. I'll read it for you. All right, you can do the first one. We'll, we'll put it off. All right, uh, so the ARPA computer network is susceptible to security violations for at least three following reasons. One, individual sites used to fiscal limitation on machine access have not yet taken sufficient precautions toward securing their system against unauthorized remote use. For example, many people still use passwords, which are easy to guess, their first names, their initial, their host names spelled backwards, a string of characters, which are easy to type in sequence. Example, ZXEVBNM. Thank you. Okay, so why is this easy? First, why is this easy? We'll start from the back. Why is this easy to type in sequence? That's the bottom row of your keyboard, right? Is this still a problem today? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is 1973. Somebody's saying, hey, reuse of passwords is a bad thing. Easy to use passwords is a bad thing. What else is interesting about here, about this? These are also issues we have today. All, All of them, right? Yeah. So individual sites used to physical limitations on machine access, right? That's just what we talked about. So it used to be a machine, you only had to think about who had physical access to it. And then you could do things like, I don't know, have the password on a sticky note on the computer, which is not great, but at least if it's random and secure, that's good. But now here, you need to take precautions towards securing their systems against unauthorized <coughs> remote use. Right? This is still a huge problem today. So it's so crazy. It's like, a, I don't know, a like ghost of the future or something going and talking to us about what's, gonna, what's literally going to be the next problem. So what is this? I can't. I'm really bad at math. So 45 years. This was 45 years ago. Is that right? Does that math check out? Yeah. Yeah. So you should never do math in front of a class, by the way, <laughs> unless you're like a math teacher. Um, so yeah, 45 years ago, talking to us about what's going to be the problem basically for the next 45 years. Like, this is still a huge problem today. <coughs> do I have a, somebody for the next part? All right. Just do two, not three. 
The TIP allows access to the ARPANET to a much wider audience than is thought or intended. TIP phone numbers are posted, like those scribbled hastily on the walls of phone booths and men's rooms. <laughs> the TIP required no user identification before giving service. Thus, many people, including those who used to spend their time ripping <coughs> off Ma Bell, get access to our stockings in a most anonymous way. Awesome, thank you. So who are they talking about, including those who used to spend their time ripping off Ma Bell? Phone freak. Phone freakers, right? He's deliberately talking about the phone freakers. And what's kind of the essence here? I actually have no idea what TIP stands for. I can guess from context. But what's the core idea here? What's the problem? It's a giant gaping hole in security. Yeah, how? It allows access to the ARPANET to a much wider audience. Yeah, with no user identification before giving service. Right? So basically, they can get into the system without being a part of it. Exactly. So this is a way that they probably created as a way for them to get remote access to their systems. But because there's no remote authentication, and because you can access these things over the phone, you can get access to these systems. I believe, I'm not 100% certain, this is what gave rise to the war dialing phenomenon, where people would set up a modem to dial a bunch of numbers, seeing if there was a machine on the other end. And if there was, it would let them in through this. This was, uh, if you haven't seen War Games, you should see that movie because it's awesome and because war dialing is actually a core component there and the hacking things are actually really good there. So yeah, so this is, um, and they're shared. So this, there's actually a couple different, you know, there's nowadays there's um, proxies are kind of shared like this by criminals that will proxy your traffic from one system to another. So they'll share these to hide their tracks. All kinds of cool, uh, cool, cool stuff. Anyone want to do number three? <coughs> yeah, I'll do it. Uh, there is lingering affection for the challenge of breaking someone's system. This affection lingers despite the fact that everyone knows that it's easy to break systems and even easier to crash them. <laughs> so what's interesting here? Oh, thank you. Let's, uh, <laughs> what's interesting here? <coughs> He knew people would just do it for fun. Yeah, yeah that people are, are doing it for fun, right? And they're, yeah, uh, they're doing it for the lols. And also, you know, and the, I think this is a, the last sentence is also key too, the thing to think about yeah, here. Want to break it and it's, it's yeah, so there's, there's two different things, right? Everyone knows that it's easy to break systems. So there's already, like the idea that security wasn't important was already present back in 73, which is still exists in a lot of places today. You think about IoT devices, you think about um, even a lot of firmware type things. I mean, these are all things that are, are still true today. And then the other thing is this notion that we talked about like confidentiality, integrity, availability. It's like even easier to crash them, right? So it's kind of almost saying like, um, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit like, oh, the noob just crash systems, but the really lead people, they know how to like, break into systems, right, without causing it to crash. Uh, so yeah, so this, this I think is one that actually has probably aged the most. There's still a lot of this, like there's still the idea of a hacker I think is still cool. But nowadays a lot of the security problems come from people who are financially motivated, right? They don't actually care about street cred or, a, you know, whatever, building up credibility. What they care about is getting money, right? And so that's, it's kind of a sad thing in some sense, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, th I think this is interesting. Oh, cool. Okay, so I guess we have one more, and I'm gonna. Do you think you're ready for it to finish up, number three? Finish it up, sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all of this would be quite humorous and cause for uh, raucous eye winking and elbow nudging if it weren't for the fact that in recent weeks at least two major serving hosts were crashed under suspicious. Two serving hosts. <laughs> yeah, a lot by people who knew what they were risking. On yet a third system, the system wheel password was compromised by two high school students in Los Angeles, no less. <laughs> we suspect that the number of dangerous security violations is larger than any of us know. It. The number of dangerous security violations is larger than any of us know. It's growing. Yeah, okay. that doesn't make sense. I think it's a uh, bad sentence. <laughs> or I copy pasted it wrong. You are advised not to sit and hope that St. Nicholas would soon be there. Cool. Okay, so a couple <laughs> interesting things that I'll point out. So the wheel password on old systems, wheel was the same thing as root, so the same thing as administrator, person who had access to everything. Yeah. 
Where did Wheels start? It's I have like no a idea. Group of administrators, right? Uh, it, I, I think it's the administrative group. Group, maybe. Yeah, that actually makes sense. Nowadays, it's a group that can use SU. Switch user so. Yeah, I'm not really certain, but the important thing here, I mean, except to translate that and get that context. <coughs> so, A, the number of dangerous security violations is large. Why is the number larger than they know? Is that just the reported stuff? These three things are just the reported stuff, which is a classic security problem. You'll have people that will claim to you that because they don't, I mean, they'll claim that they're not being hacked. And you say, why? Well, we've never, we've never seen any hacking. Nothing, nobody's hacking us. You're like, are you really looking hard enough? <laughs> like if you're not, it's very easy to not, and actually this prevents some companies from putting something like intrusion detection or something in place because then they have to deal with it and then they actually know that things are happening, <coughs> right? So oftentimes ignorance can be bliss, especially with these security incidents. Um, other, thing, other thing I like about this is like, He's freaking out that three systems were hacked into, right? <laughs> like in the 83, I guess, as a percentage of all the hosts, that's a lot. But you think about now, would anybody write an article because three systems were hacked into in like a two week span? That's not the three? Probably not. It's not. Uh, which? I guess it depends on which three. I guess if you hacked into maybe simultaneously what? Google, Apple, Amazon, Google, and shut them all down, so that would. Like credit Bureau or something. A credit Bureau, yeah. Okay. That would, that would never happen. Yeah. Never. <laughs> cool. And so what he's trying to say, right, is that, hey, look, like, yes, this is kind of a cool underground thing. It's not seen as super serious, but serious things are happening, and it's going to be a problem, which is highly, highly um, uh, very good uh, predictions of the future, because this definitely came to pass. Cool. Any other questions? which led to one of the coolest incidents that I love talking about. It's the German hacker incident. So to paint the picture, 1986, still before the World Wide Web, Cliff Stoll was a system administrator at um, Lawrence Berkeley Livermore Labs in Berkeley. So this was in the Berkeley Labs. He was a physics student. He was not a computer scientist. On his very first day, so think about, has anybody had a job where they start their first day? You do like probably training and other stuff, I don't know. So on his very first day, he starts investigating. So he was in charge of an admin for a, I wanna say a VAX machine, but I actually don't know if that's right, but some kind of shared computing machine. And you had to pay, like every account was charged per CPU cycle or whatever that they used. He found out that there is a 75 cent discrepancy between CPU time used and accounts billed. Put yourself in that situation. I don't know that I would look into a 75 cent discrepancy. I don't know about any of you. Um, maybe if you're first day, I don't know. I let, for me, I'd just be like, oh, that's weird. And you just like keep going on with your life, right? Um, <laughs> Luckily, he did not. So he found out that account, an account was created with no billing address. So how could you bill them? The billing system couldn't bill them. So he started digging in more, and he found out that there was an unauthorized account on his system, which is crazy. So at this point, what do you do? If you're an administrator, delete the account. Depends on the policy. This is the 80s, 86. There's no policy. Look at the logs. They weren't even thinking about figure that. Figure out how he got in. Look at the logs to figure out how they got in so that you can try to fix it, right? That could be one way. Uh, so what at most, most time they do is they record the activities of the hacker. They let them, they make a honey trap and they record the logs. Right, so this was a little bit before a honey trap and I think the system that they're using is probably many hundreds of thousands of dollars so you can't just make a separate one. But you can try to find and try to figure out what, they're, what the attacker is doing, right? To get more information and maybe find out who they are, especially if they're maybe calling into your system through the phone network, maybe you can do that phone trace. So I'll link to it in the, in the end here, but there's a whole book here called The Cuckoo's Egg, which I highly recommend if you're interested in this stuff to, down, like, to get it, read it, buy it. Um, 
it's a super good read, and it's written by Cliff Stoll, so it's like a first-hand account of what happens. And so he wanted to figure out what was going on. So he did all those things, except for delete the account. So he investigated the logs, figured out technically how this was happening. He started contacting people because he had no idea what to do. Of, um, he eventually contacted and got a hold of the FBI in order to say, hey, this is happening. And he had this whole system set up to monitor what this person was doing on the system. <coughs> so what he found out was there was a configuration problem in Emacs where Emacs, as it was installed, would work as a mailer. So it could be used as a mail system. And it would move a user's email from varspool mail, where all the mail would come into the system, to their home directory. Um, <coughs> you'll get into it later, but the so this is actually, so Emacs itself was fine. There was no vulnerability in Emacs, no vulnerability in this. The problem was with the configuration. So the LBL administrators before Cliff, because he just started, right? Maybe his fault. Um, they needed the move mail to have root privileges. So they had it as set UID. And basically, this allowed move mail to have anybody move files to any directory of the system. <laughs> So the hacker exploited this bug to substitute his own copy of one of the utilities on there, in this case, the at run program. So after it executed, what it would do was copy the original program back. So it would replace itself as the old one so that that way the um, attacker could get in. So he got administrative access. He broke passwords of other user accounts. He created accounts. He created backdoor programs. He's all, uh, like I say, can say he because we find out who it is later. Um, and then Cliff started seeing that he used the LBL to connect to military systems in the Milnet because LBL uh, worked a lot with the military on a lot of things. And the military sites, so this is the 86, the, and databases. So again, those hackers coming into the LBL machine and then from there connecting to Milnet computers and everything's in the clear, so Cliff can see everything that's happening on those remote systems as well. And so he sees that this person searching for SDI, which at the time was the, was the keyword for Strategic Defense Initiative, Stealth, SAC, Strategic Air Command, Nuclear, NORAD. At this point, you should freak out if you're a Cliff Stoll, <laughs> right? Yeah, at this point, he was talking to the FBI, but then he had, I can't remember the exact details, but he basically like started talking to Air Force, Army people, about like what was going on because he's like, this is way above my pay grade. Like I'm involved in all this kind of craziness. Um, and so yeah, this is when he called the FBI because he was freaking out. So with the help of the FBI, what they found out was <coughs> they were actually able to trace the person to Hanover to a university there. And eventually by working with, um, he worked for the, so they found a hacker, uh, Marcus Heiss, who worked for the Eastern Bloc that was using machines to break into university, like LBL machines, and then obviously that, and then um, trying to steal basically military information and military secrets. Um, so, yeah, so anyways, so this, the book, highly recommend it. Uh, this is super, this is like a firsthand account of basically like nation state cyber espionage in 1986. So it's kind of on you to read this and then start projecting into the future about what things are likely like now, which is super cool to think about. Yeah. Did that other slide just say that he only spent eight months in jail for that? Yes. So because he wasn't, I don't think, a year, a year and eight months. A year and eight months, yeah. Um, and then he was put on probation. So this is also, I don't, and I don't remember all the details here about who he was arrested by, <coughs> where he was prosecuted, and where he spent the time in, because that's not really relevant to the story. But it is a little bit in the sense that, as we'll see, they don't really know what to do with people with, they don't know how to prosecute these kind of like cyber, like what we would call cyber crime now. Um, they didn't know what to do with these people because there were not really any laws in place. Cool. Highly recommend this book. It is amazing. The next famous incident I want to talk about is the internet worm, which is super fun. So in 1988 was the first internet worm. So what's a worm? I, did we talk about that before? I don't think so. What's a worm? A piece of malware that transmits itself to other computers. 
Yeah, so it's a some kind of essentially you say mal malware, malicious software that. Can I choose this still? Yeah, so that exploits vulnerabilities <laughs> in others. So it scans somehow local systems, identifies vulnerabilities in them that it knows about, exploits them, copies itself over to them, and runs a copy on that system, which will scan its local network. So it spreads and worms itself basically throughout the network. Um, so this is actually a super interesting story. So. Uh, 1988, the internet worm, which was eventually, as we found, we will find out, was developed by uh, Robert Tavin Morris, whose hacker alias was RTM, uh, was released. So this depends, there's a lot of different versions of this story. Uh, one story is that he was, he was, I believe, I want to say a student at MIT, but I don't remember 100%. I think that's right. Um, was working on you know just developing a cool virus and then accidentally got out and it was like a total accident right just doing something for fun in your own network and then it accidentally accidentally get released. Um, there's one problem though, so it did have this ability to it would do crazy kinds of stuff where it would scan the it would scan the network, look for other machines, it would scan the <coughs> I think it would parse like ETC hosts, it would parse any trusted host to figure out what are the hosts that this machine trusts, try to propagate that way. But one problem it had in there, I think, was checking if it was running. So if you, so if you think about any type of virus or worm, like a biological sense, right? If you're already infected, you don't want to like infect people again. And especially in a computer system, you don't want a thousand copies of this worm running, you only want one. Uh, but I believe he had a mistake in there where it would like continually act, like take over everything, and so all that would be running were copies of this worm. Um, so the internet had to be turned off, is what happened. And this was such a big deal because what would happen is your computer would get connected to the internet, and then it would just like halt because you have so many copies of this worm running, you can't do anything, you can't even patch it. So they had to distribute patches. And then they had to shut off, coordinate, again, shut off all the machines on the internet, fix them, and turn them back on. And if I believe one of the cool things about this worm was that it was actually a multi-architecture worm because it would, instead of copying over its binary, it would copy over its C source code and then compile itself on the new system and then run that new copy there. Um, so it's pretty sophisticated and it used a number of different vulnerabilities as we'll see, but it was super cool. Um, so the damages were estimated on the order of like $100,000, which back then is actually, I mean, it's a decent amount of money. Um, so RTM was sentenced to three years probation, a $10,000 fine, and 400 hours of community service. An interesting result of that, has anybody heard of CERT, C-E-R-T, the Computer Emergency Response Team? So there, what they realized was that there's no coordinated way to deal with this, right? Basically. I mean, if you think about it, at the time in 88, the entire US computing infrastructure that was connected to the internet was down. But there was nobody to try to coordinate things of how to release patches. This was all done probably offline through telephones, uh, would be my guess. And so CERT was basically created as a direct response to this to say, OK, what do we do in these situations? And so they'll do things like release when there's a new security vulnerability. They'll release bulletins. They'll tell people how to patch and how to like stay safe. So the worm itself, so it worked on Sun 3 and Vax machines running BSD Unix. The worm had two parts. Uh, the first part had a buffer overflow in the finger D, uh, the finger daemon. So finger used to be this protocol, basically, if you wanted to ask uh, something about a user on a remote system, you would run this command, which would do this protocol and give you information about them. And as You'll eventually see when you study buffer overflows, this is a classic buffer overflow. So this is a local buffer on the stack of size 512, um, and then calling gets line. So gets reads until what? Is it a new line or a new line? It's a new line, yeah. So if you put in more than 512 characters, you're now overriding memory on the stack, which you can use to corrupt and execute whatever you want. It also used a vulnerability in send mail. So send mail had this debug option. Has anybody managed a mail server before? Like an SMTP server? Good, never do that, it's terrible. 
um, because configuring those is not, I mean, now it's terrible because having to not have your thing flagged as a spam bot, but in general, it's super difficult to debug, so there's this nice debug <coughs> feature that you could say debug and run a command and it would just execute that command, which is clearly bad. This is a built-in backdoor. Um, and so you'd use these, transfer the C code, compile it, run it, and then um, so keep. All the machines had compilers on it? Yeah, I think most, I think that was a fair assumption back then because you basically needed, you couldn't do anything without a compiler basically. You just had the standard tools and not much else. So <coughs> in order to propagate, the main program gathered inter basically looked at all the interfaces, looked at all the open connections, so what machines was this machine talking to, um, tried to break into each of these hosts using RSH, which was the beginning, I believe, of SSH, um, a resident remote shell, finger, or send mail, so it actually, so it didn't even need to use these vulnerabilities if it, um, if it could actually just log into those remote systems. Um, it gathered information on all the trusted hosts uh, because a lot of things that would happen is people in that those days were tired of typing in passwords, which I would agree that still exists today. So you go onto one machine, you type in your password to log in, and then you need to remote log into another machine, so you need to type that machine's password. So instead of doing that, what they'd say is, hey, this IP address is a trusted IP address, so if I ever log in from there, trust that IP address. And so those were specified in these dot our host file um, were the hosts that you trusted. Yeah. So then you could just RSH into those hosts and log in with no problem to propagate the worm without even needing any vulnerability. Um, and it would then perform password cracking. So this was like a fully featured worm, right? It's not just a one vulnerability to propagate and spread. Multiple unknown vulnerabilities, unpatched vulnerabilities, using this RSH trust and trying to crack all the passwords of all of the other users on the system so that it could log in as them and get their R host and try to propagate from there. Wow. Pretty crazy. So you can read more about this here. Um, the interesting thing is you don't have to feel super sorry for RTM. Um, there's a couple interesting things there. I believe his dad at the time was the I want to say was very high up in the NSA. I think that's true statement. Um, he also ended up being a professor at MIT. So maybe he wasn't at MIT then. Anyways, and he also maybe heard of a Y Combinator. Yeah. The startup incubator. Yeah, he helped co-found that. So he's doing, he's, right. he's doing fine. <laughs> but it's a great like insight into the kind of very first worm and very first, you can think of it like internet scale crisis where like everything's going down, everything's being attacked, like it's, and nobody knows what's going on or how to fix it. Um, so there's a lot of good resources out there about reading about the internet worm that I recommend you check out. Cool, questions so far? This is fun. Think about back then, like it's crazy. Like just like vulnerabilities everywhere, like you can't even, I mean, that's, and that's kind of what Bob Metcalf was talking about. It's like, yeah, everyone knows all these problems exist, but until you actually have these incidents, it really doesn't solidify in everybody's mind. They're like, oh, we should be fixing these proactively and not just trusting people not to do bad things. Was there a reason if he was a college student, he didn't report some of these errors as soon as he found them? I think it was... Other it, than the interest of seeing was, what he could you, do with them? I don't know because I don't know him and don't want to put words or thoughts in his mouth, I, in my opinion, that culture didn't exist at the time. Mm -hmm. So I think if you found something like that, there would even be no, like, who would you even talk to? Like, um, so yeah, there, it wasn't really this culture of, oh, patch this thing, or, um, or oh, I found some vulnerability in your whatever, like, I don't know, it was very much, I think, less of that than there is now. Like now you'd be like, why would you do that? Exactly, I'd say like, why wouldn't you tell them so they could fix this? And now there's so many nice ways to have private networks if you want to do something like this, but you definitely need to do it very carefully, so. Cool, okay, so <coughs> going on, so now we're gonna talk about one of the kind of most famous or well-known hackers. Um, so Kevin Mitnick, he, 
Is this his? Yeah, okay. So he has a crazy history. So he got put on one year probation for trying to break into uh, some offices to try to get some, some things. And then he enrolls at USC to use campus machines to perform illegal activities, uh, which he got six months in juvenile prison. He then breaks into a really large company, SCO, which he got sentenced to three year probation for. Um, he's expelled from Pierce. He breaks into DEC and steals software. He's caught by the FBI. Um, he then violates probation and goes into hiding. He had a $1 million warrant out for his arrest. Uh, he was accused of invading the San Diego Supercomputer Center while apparently in hiding on the run. Um, and this attack is super cool. So, um, I'll read the warrant issued by the Department of Motor Vehicles. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I've never asked that question. <laughs> Outstanding parking tickets? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's not that. Yeah. Uh, huh. Good question. Maybe it was an Al Capone thing. That was all they could get him on. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to look that up. That's an interesting point. Thanks. So one of the cool things technically about this SDCC attack was it was an incredibly sophisticated for its time PCP spoofing attack. So basically, <laughs> let's see if I have a good, no I do not. Okay, so essentially what happened is, <coughs> and this is something that I think we'll get into when we talk about network security. So essentially there were two hosts in this system that trusted each other. So one was the server, which had a boot image, and the other was this X terminal. And the idea was this X terminal allowed unauthenticated logins coming from the server. So if you can spoof being the server, you could log in and do whatever you want to the X terminal. Um, as you'll eventually see, TCP has a lot of reasons why this is actually difficult to do because it uses sequence numbers, and so if you can't see that communication, you have to basically guess and spoof that, that uh, sequence number. Um, but he was able to pull it off, so he uh, committed it. He did a denial of service attack against the server, so you basically take the server down so it doesn't respond and say, hey, what are you talking about? We're not talking, like stop talking to me. Um, he then impersonated the server with respect to the X terminal, and then he executed a basically the equivalent of an RSH X terminal. So this is go to the X terminal, basically just like SSH, and do echo plus plus to slash dot R hosts. So what we talked about, so R host is this trusted file, and I believe plus plus means accept any login from any remote system in this RSH format. So by doing this, because you only have to get this once, right? So you can continually try. Once this happens, then you can log into this X terminal system uh, without any password or anything, because he's been able to execute that one command. So it's actually a, and apparently I didn't realize this until I started digging in more, but apparently it's a bit of a uh, controversy if he actually did this or not, or if it's somebody else and he's like claiming credit for them. I don't know, it's super weird, but check out this link if you want to learn more about this, because it's a cool, interesting story. Um, he was finally found, so the Department of Motor, Motor Vehicles got their man, as they always do, and the <laughs> FBI arrested him. He served a 46 uh, months in prison, um, and then he was finally released in January 2000 with a probation that forbid him from connecting to the internet or sending email, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Um, and so in 2003, he could finally surf the internet. He's on Twitter, if you want to follow him on Twitter. Um, so. He still goes to hacker conferences and stuff. And kind of the cool thing is this became like a, he became like a folk hero for hackers. Yeah. Well, that might be about 2000 plus five. I would say uh, it's probably the five standard years. thing of like five years. No, he's released after prison from five years. And then his probation was probably for three years. Yeah. And then the map here, I don't know. It's, like prison math is different, right? <laughs> Which is true. You could be sentenced to something for a year, but only serve you know six months or whatever, right? I don't know. 
At least that's what movies tell me. So the interesting thing about Kevin Mitnick is he became kind of this underground, uh, basically like a hacker folk hero. And so one of the things, so when you talk about when hacking used to be this kind of like for the lulls and this cool thing, is you'd hack into it. So this is what, id? I think this is id's uh, website, which made, uh, the people who made Quake. So one of the things you do is break into people's web servers, deface their web server to do something like uh, free Kevin now. So this was somebody, uh, some hacking crew broke into this website and replaced the default HTML with uh, free Kevin Mitnick. So this was like a thing embedded in hacker culture through the, the early 90s, or early mid, I guess in late 90s. So more recent ones, which I love talking about, is Albert Gonzalez, and he serves as a very good warning. So this is Albert, don't be like Albert. He and his crew used uh, which another thing you'll learn in the class, SQL injection vulnerabilities to steal credit cards. They stole about 170 million credit cards, which is a lot. Um, they were responsible for Dave & Buster's, so they broke into basically all of Dave & Buster's, uh, TJ Maxx, Heartland payment systems, this was a cool thing. They would, uh, they actually got into a credit, but when you start thinking like a criminal, what they would do is they would first start driving around to various like retail locations like TJ Maxx, <coughs> find an unencrypted Wi-Fi that they could just log into. They'd log in, they'd be on the corporate network, and from there they'd propagate and find the machine that was processing credit cards or had processed credit cards, use some vulnerability to steal those credit cards. They realized this, man, all those credit cards go through payment processing companies. So what if we get inside there, then we can steal all those credit cards as they're going through the payment processing company, which they did, and which is how they stole uh, roughly 170 million credit cards. Um, and you can see maybe the evolution in punishment because they were found, arrested, tried, found guilty, and on March 25th, he was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. Um, I also like this story because there's a Rolling Stone article about this on uh, the fast times and hard fall of the Green Hat Gang. So that was their uh, gang thing. Uh, and I'll just read the very start of this. They've been high all weekend long on ecstasy, coke, mushrooms, and acid. <laughs> so it's a, they were like not just a hacking crew. They were apparently a hard partying, crazy hacking crew spending their illicit money on drugs and hotels and stuff. So. Uh, it's super crazy uh, to read about, but they all went to jail. <laughs> Don't do bad things, which we'll talk about next. Um, another really, this is actually a very sad story, but it's a good example of a different type of threat. So uh, this person, uh, Vitek, he, so he was, I believe, a system administrator at this Australian Queensland sewage um, sewage system. He was let go from his job, and but his credentials to the systems were not revoked. So being the very upset employee that he was, he went on to the physical sewage systems and released the gates <coughs> to release flu uh, uh, sewage, I think, into the ocean, which then went into the beaches and like caused not just like for like all the tourists and the hotels that are on the beaches, but also like ecological problems with wildlife and stuff. So uh, yeah, crazy, um, hundreds of thousands of liters of, of raw sewage. Uh, really insane when you think about it. Uh, marine life died, it was terrible. He was convicted of 30 counts of hacking their system and he was sentenced to two years in prison. Um, so this is the Australian legal system, I can't really comment. I barely know the American system, so. Um, but this is a super interesting example of like an insider attack, right? So this is somebody who used to have access, who because you had bad controls in place of when to terminate their employment and terminate their credentials, um, they got into the system. So uh, how long do we have? It's Five 50, minutes. right? Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, other things, uh, web defacements, as we saw with the id thing. There's a lot of worms that were flying around in um, the early 2000s. So basically what happened is Microsoft Windows was full of holes uh, that were basically remotely exploitable. So people would, all these ones, Slammer, Blaster, Code Red, um, these were all worms that would take advantage of Windows software. Um, 
Blaster's author was an 18 year old, which is kind of crazy. Um, and okay, I want to talk about something else real quick. So I'm going to skip that last part. Cool. Ethics, ethical hacking. So I just hopefully scared you about jail, about all of those people who <laughs> went to jail. Um, so, okay, is this a class on hacking? Yes, this is a class on hacking. Hacking is not a bad word. Um, it, I think it's Eugene Levy has a really good book. I think it's just called Hackers, which kind of traces this origin of this term hacker, which originally comes from just, what well, actually has two meanings. One, well, when you talk about a hack, a hack can be either something that's like so ugly but works, and it actually comes from the MIT, I think it's like the Model Railroad Club because they would do, I don't know, I guess model railroads can be super complex with all kinds of switching. And so if you wired something up in like a really ugly way, that would be called a hack. But if you also figured out how to make things work in a way that they shouldn't, that was called like a hack, but like a cool hack. Like, wow, like what a cool hack. Uh, so hacker kind of has the same meaning. It has a lot of connotations. Um, in the popular media, it's very much seen as negative, as a negative thing. Okay, so this is what people usually think when you look at a news article of a hacker, so like somebody in a hoodie touching a screen for some reason. Uh, and oh, this is, so these are all, this is a movie you should watch. You should watch Hackers. I watched that actually recently. I think, is this, this looks like The Matrix or something. Um, and then Mr. Robot. Uh, but this is more like what a hacking team looks like. So this is a uh, shellfish from, I can't remember what year, but am I in this? No. Okay. So this is in their hotel room during DEF CON CTF playing in CTF. So it's just people on their laptops uh, in a network. So, um, oh, cool. So yeah, so it actually backs up what I was saying. That's awesome. So yes, and then Hacker started from this crazy model railroad thing, but those same people were the first people who had access to computer systems in the 60s. And then the term hacker kind of got this computer wizard connotation. Um, and it was one of those things like you're not a hacker unless a hacker calls you a hacker. Hmm. So you have to kind of wait uh, for that and you can't be, okay, good. So, and, but it's really, I mean, now it's kind of, so you do have to be careful, I and mean, this is a real thing, you have to be careful when you talk about yourself and know your audience. So if you're going around bragging that you're such a cool hacker and you're in this hacking class, people will probably get the wrong idea. So a couple of things, you can just use the term ethical hacking, which is a nice catch-all. You put the term ethical in front of it because that is what we're doing and I'm teaching you about ethics now. Um, otherwise, you can say, I don't know, um, computer security or something like that, that also works too. Um, <coughs> so, um, okay, so ethics, talking about this. Is malicious hacking legal? No, it is definitely not legal. So you cannot hack into something that you do not have permission to do so. So it's very, very, it's actually very simple. Think, <laughs> do I own this system? If the answer is no, then don't do it. You can think, do I have permission to break into this system? If the answer is no, do not do it. We live in a day where there are Docker containers full of every software that you can run on your system. You have a virtual machine. Any software that's running on your local machine is fair game. You can do whatever you want to it. But once you start trying to run stuff against other people, that's definitely where it crosses a line. Um, an important thing is to discuss, so why is it important to discuss vulnerabilities and how they're exploited? So that they can be fixed. So that they can be fixed, right? Because, you know, I, you are all very smart. If you find an unknown vulnerability, it is likely that you are not the first person to find that. But that other person may not have told anybody about it and may have sold it to some government where they're using it for whatever, or sold it to underground hackers who are using it to compromise people's computers to steal their username and passwords. Um, so, so that's why I think it's important to try to share that information. So um, avoiding jail is easy. Don't do anything illegal. Don't do anything illegal and then say you learned it from fish or I in this class. <laughs> I mean, definitely don't do that because I have documentation that I'm doing this to you right now. So basically, it's just like I said, don't hack into a system you don't own or have permission. 
if you find some super awesome remote Mac zero day that gives you remote execution on somebody's machine, you can't just run that against anyone in this class and be like, oh, it's part of the class. If you ask them and say, hey, I have this thing, is it cool if I try it against you? If they say yes, then you can do it. If not, don't do it. The odds are just to not do that. And if you find something like that, tell Apple. They'll. I don't actually know if they'll pay you, but that's information is worth a lot of money. So, Apple so they do have a duck bug, bug bounty, right? I didn't want to claim that without knowing for certain. So. Um, you have, there's open source, there's so much open source code out there. If you want to find bugs, go start looking at open source code. Start running it on your system. Start analyzing that for vulnerabilities. Um, the other cool thing, and especially nowadays as opposed to like 90s and mid 2000s or early 2000s, is that there are a ton of websites and systems out there that have bug bounty programs. They will pay you for telling them about security bugs. Um, the other cool way is become an academic like us. So we, oftentimes we do vulnerability analysis because an important research question is how prevalent is this vulnerability in the real world? And so to answer that, we may have to do a scan to, which is not something I would ever recommend one of you do, but if you're doing it as part of research, we can do it ethically, we can get IRB approval, we can make sure that we put safeguards in place so that you're covered. Um, so there's a lot of websites that have bug bounty programs, Google, Facebook, at and Coinbase. Um, check these out. Please follow their terms if you ever do this. There was a Facebook incident where a researcher found the ability to post on anyone's wall. Which, would you agree that that's a security violation? Yeah. Yes, very bad. He tried to report this to Facebook's security team. Uh, because of a language barrier, partly, uh, he didn't, English wasn't his first language, there was a breakdown, so he decided to post on Mark Zuckerberg's <laughs> wall to get attention about the vulnerability. And ultimately, so Facebook has a, a policy, a bug bounty policy, where they say, hey, here's a sandbox Facebook site. You can do whatever you want there. Just don't, unless you can't do that vulnerability in the test site, then don't mess with the real site. And he didn't follow that, so they didn't give him his bounty, ultimately. Um, and so here's the thing where this is him writing on Mark Zuckerberg's wall. And it was fixed within three hours. So anyways, um, OK. Uh, I'm going to let Fish take care of this because I think we're over. OK.